and we'll get started. So uh, I'd say talk amongst yourselves, but I don't think uh, you can. <laughs> but we'll be uh, we'll be getting going in about a minute's time. Okay, um, I think let's get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, this lunchtime. Um, and welcome to this Depth Talk Live, where for about the next uh, 25, 30 minutes, we're going to be discussing how to scale um, digital experiences using headless CMS technology. Um, during the discussion, if you have any questions at all or uh, comments or whatever, then please uh, just use the chat function, type in, type in your question, and we'll try and pick it up uh, towards the end so it doesn't kind of disrupt the flow of the presentation. Uh, but please, any questions, and just put them in the chat. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, first of all, um, if you can find the mouse, there we go. Um, first of all, I just want to introduce uh, the speakers today. So first of all, um, I'm Jonathan Whiteside. I'm a Principal Technology Consultant um, at the International Digital Agency, DEPT. Um, and I'm joined today uh, by Thomas Clayson, who's the Principal Solutions Engineer at Headless CMS Contentful. So before we begin, uh, we will just do a quick one minute, uh, 30 seconds each intro to who our organizations are and therefore you know, why, why we're qualified to speak on the subject today. Um, so DEPT, um, I work for DEPT. Um, DEPT is, a, as I say, an international digital agency who combine creativity, technology and data. Um, we're a team of 2,000 thinkers and makers uh, located across 30 different offices in 13 countries and, uh, and we have 20 years of experience. Um, and we do a number of different things, um, such as building really engaging digital experiences, implementing technology platforms, uh, digital performance marketing and media, and also brand campaigns for brands and companies such as Triumph Motorcycles, Patagonia, and Netflix. So that's just a bit of an introduction about debt. And I'll hand over to, uh, to Thomas to introduce himself and Contentful. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, hi, everyone. Yes, I'm Thomas from Contentful. I'm a solutions engineer here. And uh, Contentful founded in 2013, so we've been around for quite a while. And you can see all the stats about Contentful here, but essentially we're a headless CMS platform and our technology has been designed to help uh, digital first businesses to uh, run digital transformation projects and to become more efficient from a content point of view. And hopefully today we'll talk a little bit about some of the concepts around why headless uh, helps companies such as uh, you know, the ones that we work with to run those digital transformation projects to become more efficient and to engage their customers better. Thanks, Thomas. Um, so um, really, really, we're going to go through five things today. So five things to consider uh, when you're thinking or starting the journey to building scalable, high-performing platforms using a headless CMS platform. Um, to get started, I think when anyone researches the term headless or headless CMS, um, you come across a number of different terms, terminology, buzzwords, acronyms. So before we dive into the, the deep de all the details about scaling and performance, I think it's really important to explain some of the high level concepts to do with headless and the acronyms and descriptions that you may read or see on a daily basis, just to make sure we all have a common, a common understanding. Uh, and also just for, so you can understand where we're coming from in terms of our understanding of, uh, of what headless technology is. So terms um, 
uh, acronyms, words, uh, which are used uh, often to describe this approach uh, to these, these architectures, these headless architectures, um, headless, Jamstack, Mac, Composable. And what I'm going to do is just quickly go through each one of the four and explain what we understand them to be. So first of all, when we're talking about all these different architectural terms, um, they are architectural patterns. They're not particular technologies, they're not particular frameworks. Um, they're not proprietary to a particular company. Um, and important as well, there's no central body which is controlling or defining these standards. And they really are a set of best practices and workflows for building high speed uh, websites, which can be used uh, by any company using you know, a multitude of different technologies. And why are these things important now? Why are all these terms such as headless, such as uh, Mac and Jamstack important? Well, first of all, speed is more and more important to our end users, our customers, our prospects, um, and also to search engines such as Google. Um, everyone values speed, and we know all the stats where, you know, a, 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 100 milliseconds or a second has a massive effect on conversion rates, has a massive effect on the effectiveness of how Google indexes and spiders your website as well. Secondly, over the past 18 months, particularly, we've seen a huge increase in traffic demands. Everything has moved to be online, and therefore our services, um, our websites, our marketing are getting more and more traffic every day. Um, and so we have to have solid architectures and solid plans in place and how we can scale up to meet the demand of an increasing number of online consumers. Also, there's an increasing number of channels. Um, we're not just going to a desktop website or a tablet-based website anymore to consume the content that our organizations are wanting to publish and get out into the world. Um, we have mobile apps, we have wearables, we uh, syndicate our content across uh, multiple third-party channels. Um, we still have our websites, we have microsites. There's a, a, an growing uh, need to manage the content and our experiences across all these different channels on a daily basis. Um, and before I move on, obviously there's a need to be flexible. Um, we, with these increasing number of channels, with these increasing number of needs um, from our businesses, um, we have to react very quickly. We can't go into six month, 12 month, 18 month, 24 month projects every single time a new channel pops up or there's a need for a new app or we have to quickly spin up an e-commerce uh, solution. Um, and also we want to make our solutions as easy as possible for our, our colleagues, our internal business users. Um, and so that has been a demand particular in the past year as people were working from home and people working in remote and distributed environments. The tools that we use need to be super, super simple, need to be quick for people working in remote locations. Um, and so that's combined really the reasons why all these things have started to come to a head in the past 12 months um, and why it's uh, a lot of organizations, perhaps yourselves, are looking at headless technologies and saying, okay, how do we scale things up? How do we maximize the performance? when we're implementing these new approaches. So headless, very, very quickly. Um, headless is the approach where we separate our, our front ends, our heads from our back end technologies and our data. Um, and what we do is we completely decouple these, these two uh, things. Um, that allows us, uh, and we expose the content from our back end systems, from our back end products via APIs. We may even put a middle layer in here, an API layer uh, to consolidate, to orchestrate all the different tools that we have in the background. But essentially, uh, at a very high level, we're going to have multiple consumer applications, websites, applications, wearables, all those things I talked about, uh, who want to hit the same APIs to get consistent data, content, and assets from uh, as fewer backend systems as possible. Um, usually in a headless approach, and not always, uh, we tend to use SaaS-based headless products, access through APIs, and the front ends, and this is quite critical, the front ends don't really need to have any knowledge of what those back-end systems are. They're just hitting APIs, and as long as they understand what the API endpoints are and the contracts are, they're good to go. Um, another big benefit is it allows us to scale the front-end experiences, so the applications completely independently of the backend services. 
um, which is a benefit we'll, we'll discuss a little bit later on and then uh, another couple of points. Okay, uh, Jamstack. Uh, Jamstack is a word which, or an acronym, uh, which is used to explain uh, how to implement or a particular way of implementing front-end technologies. So by using JavaScript, APIs, and HTML markup and combining them all in the front end. Um, so I've just did a, a brief uh, description, which you can read. Um, obviously, JavaScript, dynamic probing language uh, to request and respond uh, to requests from a, an internet browser. Um, APIs, um, a way of getting access to data through common, uh, common communication methods. And then the markup. So this is the presentation, the HTML, the markup for your website, which is then rendered by the browsers themselves. Um, Jamstack has a particular approach where it tries to generate static sites as much as possible. And we will talk about that particular topic by itself in about 10 minutes. Then another term is used is Mac. And Mac is really not just a front end technology stack. It's also it's the full, full uh, vertical stack. Um, and Mac stands for microservices. So that's deploying uh, business logic, business capabilities into small chunks accessible through independent APIs. So it means that a new business capability or functionality can be deployed quickly and independently of others. Instead of having to deploy you know, every three months, every six months and deploy the entire application, we deploy small chunks. Um, access through APIs, which I've just explained. Um, the tools, particularly the backend tools should be cloud native. Um, SaaS based services that allow for uh, robust security, elastic scaling, uh, and are based, uh, available on demand. And then using a headless approach, uh, that decoupled approach where the front end applications, consumer applications, are completely decoupled from the back end services. So um, just go back to the diagram I showed uh, uh, two slides ago. Um, you can see that both Mac and Jamstack are good ways of describing this particular architecture, where the back end is uh, separated from the front end and we communicate between the two through a set of APIs. There's another term uh, which is used uh, quite regularly or in with increasing frequency, um, particularly by analyst organizations at the moment is composable. And composable is another way of explaining the same type of architecture, which is using best of breed components or best of breed backend services and combining them together through APIs um, to meet the needs of your application. So your application just getting the content, the data, the capabilities it needs by hitting APIs from a number of different services and then bringing them together and composing the experience on the front end. I particularly like the term composable because of the last points on this slide, which is business focused. A big part of composable is having the presentation layer or the presentation of your application um, managed uh, by the business. So the business users being able to compose different areas uh, of pages of the applications themselves and having some control. Um, I personally like that because a lot of the other architecture is very focused on the technologies in place and how the technologies integrate together and the architectural principles. But I like Composable because it is starting to think about the business user. So following my train of thought on from, um, from the business user, these architectures, I think it's also important to consider what's the impact on the business users, our internal colleagues who are working with and have to use these systems every day. Uh, does it take away control? Does it give control? Um, what are the features of the tools that allow us to have these highly scalable architectures, but also allow our business users to have maximum control? Um, I'm, I'm gonna hand over to Thomas to discuss how Contentful handles up, because I think that's a very good example to see it in action. So uh, Thomas, over to you. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, so here at Contemple, we really asked ourselves the question around the editorial experience. So if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide for me, Jonathan. Um, and we really wanted to focus on making that editorial experience better because we understand that as we take a headless approach, as Jonathan was talking about, and we decouple the presentation layer from the content hub, essentially from the content backend, that we also disconnect our uh, our business users, our editors' ability to visually conceptualize how they build uh, content, uh, you know, uh, examples or content infrastructure, content uh, pages on their websites or in apps. 
So we really wanted to focus on making that editorial experience better, making it more efficient. So today I'll, I'll talk about two apps that we've recently released to try and solve some of these challenges. Uh, the first one that you're looking at here is Compose. And Compose is a new editing experience that enables content authors to easily create and manage web content in a page-based structure. So we're still using structured content. We're still using that headless approach with reusable content blocks, but we're giving editors a page centric view of content and we're enabling that composable architecture. The impact uh, on the implementation of Contentful is negligible. You're still having that same headless uh, experience when you develop and build your front ends. You can still plug this into static site generators or any other front end technology. And you still get all the benefits of working with a headless CMS, but the ergonomic interface enables editors to work in a more familiar environment, reducing onboarding time and reducing the incidence of human error that can come about from having complex content architectures. So ultimately Compose empowers digital teams to leverage Contentful for web content creation and delivery without technical support. And um, we also thought about the other side of, of content. So uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, advancing one more, thank you. So, you know, the other benefit of headless technology is the ability to create reusable content that can be shared across different channels and experiences. And this adds to the complexity of our content because no longer are we talking about page templates we're talking about multiple individual components that can be combined together in this composable way to generate content. So we developed Launch. This is our, our launch interface, uh, Contemporal Launch. We developed this to make working with these large amounts of content easier by enabling a familiar campaign management style interface for scheduling content releases. So crucially, Contentful Launch allows you to publish and schedule hundreds of pieces of content with one click by combining hundreds of entries, individual content entries, into one individual release. And this ultimately enables content creators to work faster, to scale quicker, and to flexibly, flexibly manage content campaigns with a clear view of the current status of content, as well as a calendar view to see when content will be published and unpublished. So to summarize, both of these apps that we uh, have recently released serve to try and make headless CMS more accessible for non-technical teams and really solve some of the challenges that Jonathan was talking about around adoption throughout the wider business. And I'll hand back to Jonathan to carry Thanks, on. Thomas. <clears throat> Okay, so we've talked a bit about what headless and what all these, um, these acronyms mean and, and what the benefit is. And we can see that also the tooling and the tools are, um, who support these architectures are now really adding features which are focused on the business users. So um, it's becoming uh, a very attractive proposition for both business users and IT teams and digital teams to be able to implement them. So the big question is how do we then get them to scale? Um, and so there's a couple of topics that we're going to discuss. Uh, and the first one is about static site generators um, and how static site generators can be used for optimizing performance. Um, so when we're thinking about performance and speed of the website, there's really only um, two things that we're, we're concerned about or two main topics we're concerned about. The first one is the amount of time it takes a server to render the markup or render the data to be able to serve to the web browser or to be re returned as a response via an API. So the amount of time the server takes to do that processing, uh, to render the output and then start the transfer is one of the big considerations to speed. And we want to try and reduce that rendering server, that server time, that server processing time as, as, as much as possible. So it's as quick as possible. The second consideration then is the time it takes to actually transfer the data from the server once it's finished rendering it to the browser. Um, so those are the big things to do with speed. And then there is a third one, which is more to do with client-side applications, which is the amount of time it takes for the client-side application 
to, to draw out, to paint the application based on the data it's received. So really three things there, the, the two things we're gonna to consider today, are the time to render and also the time to transfer. So when we're talking about static site generation, the big thing that we're trying to do is reduce the amount of time it takes to render and to respond to a request from a web browser. Um, so if we, if we look at kind of the evolution of web apps over the past, um, I would say probably 20 years or so, um, we have on the left-hand side our more traditional web application uh, where we have a server and we have a database of the, the content in, we have a content management system to manage the content, write reading and writing from that database. And then we have an app, a web application which uses some templating to grab the content from the database, transform it and then send it back to the visitor. That used to, um, and I'm generalizing here, happen on a single server. A request is made to the CMS application. Uh, the website would make requests for CMS application and everything would be done on a single server. We then moved to a headless client side application or a SPA application as it's commonly known. So think about technologies such as Angular, such as React, such as Vue. Um, and in those approaches, uh, what happened is we still had the same backend technologies from a database and a CMS, but we exposed all the content through APIs, as I discussed, through common communication methods using a standard API. Then we would create our website or our application as a client-side application using, as I say, React, Angular, those sorts of technologies. And that client-side application would then talk to the backend services through the API to get the data. That means there's less happening on the server side all it's doing is sending data. Um, so trying to reduce that render time as much as possible. But we're having to send a relatively large client side application to the browser. And also we get into that third problem, uh, which is the amount of time it takes to paint and to draw the application on the screen, um, which is a function of how quickly the JavaScript application can take that data and display uh, the presentation uh, to the user. The third option is what we're starting to see more and more of now, which is a statically generated site. And this isn't new. Um, 20 years ago, we were creating static sites. That tends to be what we were creating more than anything else. Um, but it's coming back into fashions for a number of different reasons, uh, particularly speed, um, because the headless platforms really support it. Um, for one reason. The second reason is it's tied very much into an automated build and automated continuous integration deployment process, um, which lots of organizations or most organizations are starting to implement as part of their release pipelines and deployment pipelines for web applications and sites. So this method, um, when a content editor, internal user in the CMS hits the publish button to publish a page or publish a site, it starts an automated process where the web application and the content from the CMS are combined to create and pre-render static pages and then send them uh, to a server to be able to be displayed. So here's an example. Um, we have our website, which has been built using React, for example, a number of different React components, and we're using on the CMS side um, Contentful. When either we deploy the application, so React application, or we hit the publish button in the CMS, it kicks off a process, a static build process. And there's lots of different tools we can use for this, tools such as Hugo, Gatsby, Next.js, and there's a, there's a ton of them out there. And what that pipeline does, what that automated process does, is combine the application with the content, creates a web page uh, in HTML formats, and then transfers it to the server. What it means is once it's on the server, we don't have to keep on hitting the server. We don't have to keep on the backend server. We don't have to keep on hitting the CMS, which means that pages render very, very quickly. All it is is static HTML, which is very quick to send to a, to a web browser. Additionally, we can then host these uh, web applications, these HTML files and assets in a CDN, which I will discuss a little bit later on. And also we can implement all our automated QA processes and continuous integration processes and continuous deployment processes in that static build process. So for example, unit tests or functional tests or visual tests. And if those tests fail, then we just stop the process and the page doesn't get deployed to the front end server. So it gives us that level uh, or reducing that, that, that chance of manual error, which we mentioned before. 
So the big benefits are, number one, the pages are static pages. They're pre-rendered, so they're very, very fast. Um, the front end is completely decoupled from the back end, as in we could actually turn all the back end services off in static build process, and the website would still run uh, as normal without any degradation. It's actually very secure this way as well. Because we're just hitting the front end website, we're never accessing the back end services and the back end databases. They're completely decoupled. So it's almost like reading in read only uh, mode. Um, and also, it's incredibly SEO friendly because the pre built pages, they render quickly, they load fast. Uh, the JavaScript isn't having to, to render React components or view components on the client side, uh, which has uh, or historically has had uh, SEO performance issues. Um, and really get the best or the optimum SEO performance that we can get. Of course, our websites still have some form of dynamic content or some need to interact with backend services, such as submitting forms or getting live data in some way. Um, so what we would do is uh, usually to do this, as well as the static build, which would build out the main part of the web pages, main part of the website we perhaps would have areas of the page which do need dynamic content to have pieces of JavaScript that make requests to dynamic APIs, which we expose. Those APIs would then go to our third party uh, systems um, to either submit data or request data back and then return them uh, using that JavaScript method to the, to the front end sites. The benefit is the majority of the page is still rendered statically and we're just um, adding in the dynamic data on top, so only the small pieces of data. Um, we would tend to use those, and most people tend to use service functions now, which means that we're only exposing small pieces of functionality and um, the public hosting platforms such as Azure or AWS are dealing with all the complexities about scaling. So just talking about static site generation, so that's static site generation, the benefits. Um, again, there's lots of acronyms. I've listed them here. Uh, we've discussed some of them like client-side rendering, which is the, uh, the uh, traditional way of doing client-side applications using SPARS. We have server-side rendering, which is, again, the very traditional web application where a request is made, it goes to a server, the server renders, and then it sends it back. And we have static site generation, which I've just talked through, where on build or on publish, we pre-build the website or pre-build the page and send it to a server. And then the last one is that you may see uh, mentioned is incrementic, uh, incremental static regeneration. Tr historically, a static site generation process would build the entire website out. So every time we do that, it would rebuild the website and push it to the server. And um, that's good. Uh, but when we're managing much bigger websites with thousands of pages, the amount of time it takes to generate over those, those pages can start to go into 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, three hours. So incremental static, re, site, uh, static regeneration is just republishing a single page or a set of small sets of pages. So the build process is very small, um, but still we still get those benefits. So I discussed CDNs. Um, so quickly mention um, modern infrastructures and how CDNs can help um, with this approach to, again, maximize the performance of our website and our web applications. So when I said there was two considerations, the first one is time to render and respond, which hopefully you've seen with static site generation uh, is a good way of doing that to reduce the amount of time it takes to do that. The second one is the amount of time it actually physically takes to transfer the data from the server to your web browser. So what are the things which uh, impact the amount of time it takes to transfer that data? Well, first of all, it's geography. How physically far away are you and your web browser um, or your web application or your mobile application from the server which is holding the data? And how long does it take to get from point A to point B? Second uh, consideration here is the size and the number of requests particularly in SPAR-based applications, those client-side rendering applications, those JavaScript applications are making many, many calls to backend services to get all the data and to render it. The number of requests that you're making to backend services, again, is reducing the speed and the performance of your site. So we want to try and reduce the amount of requests that we're making as much as possible. And also the size 
physical size of the payloads which are coming back from our APIs and our backend services, we want them as small as possible as well. The third benefit, which doesn't really factor into uh, the first two, but it's very important as well, is uh, redundancy. So making sure that if one server goes down, that it's the, uh, the data can still be served by another, um, which is very important for scalability, but also just in general, the robustness of the solutions we're putting together. So I don't think I have to explain what the difference between a server and a CDN is, but I'll do it very quickly. Um, and I've just stolen an image uh, from Wikipedia. So the traditional server setup, you have a single server and all the clients, all the applications which, um, which need the data will hit that one server and return it. So there's quite a lot of load. And what it means is, is geographically, it's not very well dispersed. In a CDM, we take a piece of content or an application and we disperse it over a number of different servers, which means um, there's more likely or a higher chance that um, the servers are closer to the uh, end users as possible. And we can see that here. Um, in a CDM, we would have a number of CDM nodes across different uh, geographical data centers, different ge geographical locations, and then we'd have an origin server. The origin server is where we update the content, then the CDN takes care of all the complexity of getting that content, those assets, those applications, and spreading them across all the different nodes across the world, which means our users are accessing servers which are as close to them as physically as possible, which is reducing the, uh, the time to load the data. CDNs are great because they take care of all this complexity, which is something that would be very, very hard to do previously. It would require setting up multiple servers, server farms, different data centers. And then you've got all the complexities around uh, the integrity of the data, the integrity uh, across different uh, data centers and different systems. So when we're deploying our statically uh, generated websites, um, because they are just HTML, because they are just JavaScript and image assets, we can place these because they don't need backend services backend render, rendering, we can place the, all the, these applications in CDNs. So we can put them on the origin server and then be dispersed to all these different locations. And when we update, uh, republish a particular page, um, it updates it, it invalidates the cache, and then it is dispersed across all the different, uh, across the CDN network, um, which is a very effective way of doing it. Um, and if a CDN node goes down, that's fine because we can still access probably 10, 15 others at any given time. So that's where we get our redundancy from. So I've talked a little bit about from a technology perspective and how these architectures and approaches uh, enable performance and speed. Um, but also I thought it'd be useful to, uh, to finish off by talking about how we scaled the author environment. Now, a lot of the services that we discussed um, and as we said, are SaaS based. So by their nature, they're elastic scaling. It's something that we don't need to think about provisioning servers or changing things because that's handled by the technology vendors themselves. Um, but how do we scale up with the increasing number of users, increasing number of content, increasing number of channels? And how do we use the tools to allow that, the architecture to be uh, enabled, but also make it really simple for our internal colleagues, our uh, internal business users to be able to manage that level of complexity. So again, I'm going to hand over to Thomas, who's going to talk about that from a, in the context of, uh, of Contentful. Sure. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. So we, we call this concept content scalability. So this is the idea that over time, your content model, your content architecture will get bigger and bigger and more complex as you grow and as you scale i.e. as you add more channels, as you support more regions, as your business grows, as you add other brands into the scope of your content management system. So as you grow, your content needs to keep up and new teams need to work with the content in your CMS system, as well as uh, the new channels that you need to add, need to be able to handle different touch points that you have with users. So we talk about scalability in two different ways. The first way is vertical scalability, and the second way is horizontal scalability. And vertical scalability is about expanding a single content hub as you scale, adding more content, more users, and more functionality into one instance of your CMS, for instance. 
to keep up with your needs as you grow. And this approach is very valid and a lot of people implement it very successfully. But just increasing the size of the, the content hub uh, can lead to challenges with performance, with usability and maintenance down the road, and ultimately will reduce cross-team autonomy throughout the business, increasing technical complexity. On the other hand, horizontal scalability enables you to divide your content hubs by market, channel, or business units, whatever suits your business or organizational structure. And this approach has the benefit of being essentially infinitely scalable, separating organizational concerns into smaller autonomous projects that can be managed separately and can be linked together to operate in tandem or to deliver a combination of shared and independent content. So if you don't mind going on to the next slide, we can talk a little bit about uh, an example of how this might look. So horizontally scaled content platforms are perfect for businesses that are divided up into uh, any number of autonomous or semi-autonomous teams. Building a scaled model like this one improves autonomy and uh, ultimately improves productivity as well as it allows you to build independent cross-functional teams that solve specific business problems whilst maintaining structure and removing duplication of effort across all business units. So in this example, we've divided our content architecture up by region. We may have many different markets that have some similarities and some regional differences. So we have a mechanism to share content globally. We also have a reference project, which allows us to quickly and easily spin up new regions using a predetermined content architecture that allows us to get new regions to market as quickly as possible. And we have a shared design system that allows our development teams to work in a centralized way, pushing updates out to all of the markets instantly. But clearly in this architecture, we're enabling our regional editorial teams as well. And our regional editorial teams can modify the global content, or they can add and augment their own regional content. And the advantage of this use case is that regional units have some autonomy, whilst also supplying them with global content to reduce that duplication of effort and improve the time it takes to get to market. And crucially, this model is infinitely scalable. So the more that we scale as a business, the more we can scale this content architecture. The more markets we want to support or the more regions we want to go into, uh, we can just quickly and easily spin them up and support them. And we can add new layers of hierarchy to this particular uh, model. So for instance, if we wanted to launch a new brand across all of these markets, it would be very simple for us to expand this hierarchy, add a new layer, separating out individual brands, whilst also maintaining not just autonomy across those different regions and across those different brands, but reducing the duplication of effort uh, by having those global spaces that allow us to publish content to all brands and all markets uh, instantly. So as your projects are divided up into lots of distinct content hubs, it's quick and simple for you to spin up new projects, reduce that ongoing maintenance cost or, or resource, and ultimately have a faster time to new market for new business units and for scalability reasons. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Um, I think that's very useful to see from, a, um, from an authoring experience and how the head loss approaches allow us to scale both from the front end and the back end uh, point of view. So we've now gone through kind of our five different topics. We, we have a very limited time today, so um, we've gone through them as quickly as possible. So I hope that we've covered well kind of head loss. What does it mean? What are all the acronyms? What are all the, all, all the different terms that are used at the moment to describe a very similar approach? Um, number two is we discussed the tooling that's available now to help our business users and reduce the impact of these architectural changes to our business users. We discussed static site generators and how they reduce the rendering time um, of, of our sites. Um, and four, we discussed CDNs and modern infrastructure 
um, and how they reduce the amount of time it takes to actually receive the data. And then five, we discussed about how we can scale the author environment to be infinitely scalable across different channels, across different countries, across different regions. So I know there's a couple of questions. I've just been uh, quickly going through them uh, in the chat. So um, I will quickly go through them because uh, I've seen a few drop in. So the first one is, are you working on a preview option so you can see how uh, the content looks on a page? Um, so probably a good one for Thomas to, to take in terms of how you preview uh, the content that's, uh, that's generated in this way. Sure, yeah. Um, I assume this relates to when I was showing uh, the example of the Compose interface. Yeah, uh, and yeah, Compose comes with out of the box a uh, preview functionality, uh, essentially a live preview functionality that allows you to see changes that you're making in the Contentful app uh, also appear on your live website. So uh, this is actually a really useful way. It's another way that we're trying to enable editors is through uh, giving a live preview API, your developers can now enable you to experience changes that you're making live on your website, exactly how your visitors will experience those uh, customer uh, you know, experiences, those journeys that you're building. So um, yeah, ab absolutely, there is a, there's a preview functionality. It's really powerful. It's going to enable you to build better experiences and to get that content right the first time, um, rather than having to publish and keep going back and iterating over that content. Perfect, thank you, Thomas. Um, next question is, can you generate static sites per device type? Um, not meaning responsive websites, but more a radically different design for each device, such as web, mobile, TV, uh, using the same data from the CMS. Um, so I'll take that because I was talking about static site generation and the answer is absolutely yes. Um, so uh, during that build process where we generate the static sites, we don't have to be generating one static site. We could be generating five, six, seven, however many we want. So we could have different React applications or different template applications for each one of the different channels that you mentioned, such as web, phone, TV. Um, and as you publish a page or publish a site within the CMS, um, then it's triggering the build processes and static site generations for each one of those applications. Um, and crucially as well, you can send the outputs of that static site generation to multiple locations. Um, so different servers, different environments, different CDNs, uh, different endpoints, um, you've got full control. So yeah, there's, there's no limit to that in terms of the number of channels or different outputs that you can have uh, from a single page publish. I hope that answers that. Um, there's been uh, quite a discussion on Netlify. Um, Netlify is a tool that, that we use at Depth as well. There's, there's others such as platform.sh and, and other tools, um, which can help with this whole process. Um, the Jamstack movement was very much um, coined by the founder of Netlify. Um, and so the tooling is set up to do this. Um, where as code is checked into a Git repository or any repository you like, that um, Netlify then builds. Um, so has got integrations with CMS systems such as Contentful um, uh, and builds a process and then deploys to that own CDN network, taking, uh, taking away that process of having to do it. And we've seen great success using it. Um, so I would definitely look into it if this is a, an architectural approach that you're thinking about taking. Um, what's next question here is, um, how would you know where source content is surfaced across web pages or different channels? That's quite a, a, dif a difficult question. Of course, you should know where you're join this. If, if you're doing the static site generation side of things, then you should know where, uh, content is, um, is being published to because you're in control of that. When you're generating the site and sending it to a CDN or sending it to a set of web servers, um, you know where you're sending it and you know how many channels there are. Um, and so you can track that back in a piece of content. You can say, okay, you know, which, which applications are then uh, being generated and where those pages being sent to. So you are in control from a static site generation point of view. When you're exposing your content through a headless API, 
uh, and you're just exposing the API, then applications can pick it up, then it's a bit harder because you could have a numerous number of uh, consumer applications such as websites, web apps, mobile apps, hitting those APIs. Um, in those cases, what we would recommend is, uh, and we showed it in one of the diagrams, is having an API layer above the different backend services. So implementing an API gateway of some description, uh, AWS has one, Azure has one, uh, Google Cloud Platform has one, and all requests going through that API gateway. Uh, the benefit is you can see where the requests are coming from. Um, you can secure those requests as well. So only uh, client, ap client applications who have got secure keys can access it. Um, and so then you get full auditing history of which client application requested what content from what API, and you can start to understand that. Um, it's quite uh, detailed, uh, but in that way, you can then restrict access to particular APIs or particular pieces of content by the, the key that's being used. Um, there's a couple of links here for more information. Uh, so thank you for that. People have been commenting. Um, some very specific questions about how to interact with um, MS Dynamics, CRM. Um, if you don't mind, we'll follow up with you directly on that after, uh, after uh, the talk. Um, and then what about analytics reporting is probably the last question. Um, so analytics reporting is done the same way we're requesting dynamic content. Um, so it's, analytics is usually done through, um, through JavaScript tags. Um, to hit the, the analytics settings, uh, to hit, hit the analytics services. Now, I know that there is a, a move based on kind of cooking laws and things um, and browser settings to move to server, server side tracking. Um, and that's something that can be implemented in some way using, uh, using this approach, uh, but requires a little bit more uh, thoughts in terms of how to set up the architecture to allow it. Um, but in practice, in general, and how most people are doing it at the moment is injecting JavaScript tags, which are called dynamic services um, on the website. It doesn't slow down the speed of the page being rendered because it is a JavaScript call after the page has been painted. Um, so you still get the performance issues, uh, performance um, benefits, but still getting the reporting and the tracking side of things. So I think I've just hit just over the time allocated. Um, Thank you for your questions. There's a lot of questions. What we'll do is we will um, follow up on a number of them uh, individually. So thank you very much for, for, for sending them. Um, and thank you very much for joining. And I think this, uh, this meeting, it, this uh, talk is uh, recorded so you can watch over it again if necessary. And I just want to say thank you to Thomas as well uh, from Contentful uh, for joining us today and, and adding that extra context to, uh, uh, to things. So thank you very much, everyone, um, and enjoy the rest of your day.